Bill Morgan, president of Parker University. And I'm here today in Stu McGill's office, office slash home um, up, in, up here in Canada. Stu McGill is, is a world-renowned researcher and um, scientist. Stu, thanks for having us up here. Thanks so much for coming, Bill. We're, we're having a ball here. We've known each other for a lot of years. Yeah. And uh, it's just so much fun not to have the constraint of <laughs> Skype or technology and just being here in person discussing oh, truly. spiny things. Well, we, we first met in 2007 when I was the White House chiropractor and I was consulting you on some, some conditions that were there. So that I was experiencing, but and, and actually brings me to a topic that we both share a great deal of interest in is the mechanism of injury for lumbar disc herniations and extrusions. So what, what causes disc extrusions? So what should the practitioner in the field know about disc extrusions and what we should do to treat them? Well, uh, several things need to be considered. It's usually a combination of things and it's usually a cumulative situation, much more common than an acute, although acute, acute single-time loads do occur. But uh, generally speaking, and I'm just going to reach up to get uh, one of our models here, these have all been produced by dynamicdiscdesigns.com, which I don't have any business relationship to, but what they have done is as we've documented these various mechanisms over the year, they've created very biofidelic models that really show the mechanisms. So if I just had a person on their hands and knees doing a cat camel uh, exercise, taking their spine through the range of motion, there's no risk of disc herniation if, if they have a, a virgin back. It doesn't matter. But if you take the spine through the range of motion under load, now you work apart the layers of collagen fibers. So this is not a ball and socket joint like a hip or a shoulder. It is in fitting into the category of an adaptable fabric. So if I wanted to work a hole in that beautiful jacket, I would simply create stress strain reversals back and forth on the material and the weave of the fibers would slowly get loose and delaminate. So the disc is layer upon layer of collagen fibers held together with a, gra a ground substance. And if you keep moving the disc under load, the hydraulic pressure of the pressurized nucleus slowly starts to work its way through the delaminations that form because of movement. So you'll notice how very uh, strong categories of people like strong men or power lifters, they walk around in Birkenstocks because they can't tie their shoes. Their spine is so gristled and so stiff that they can't bend the, the collagen, but that's the stiffness that they've adapted so they, they, they can't take much move, m movement. Now you take a dancer or a gymnast, people who train with body weight and don't lift heavy loads. They have wonderful mobility in their spines because they've adapted the collagen to be soft. But the problem comes when you combine the two worlds and confuse the adaptation process. So you might have now in a modern lifestyle, a person who sits at a computer for eight or more hours in a flexion stressed position, which in on its own may not be that bad. But then they go to the gym for an hour every night and start lifting loads where they're taking their spine through the range of motion. So cumulatively, the collagen is asked to move, but then it's also pressurized and uh, the, the, the nucleus behind gets pressurized and slowly it works its way through the delaminated collagen. So I can show you now in this wonderful model, we look down inside, see the gel, it goes uh, under pressure with compression, but the collagen has delaminated in the posterior right corner. So when we bend forward and squeeze, you can see the disc bulge coming out. Now, this is exactly what we see on dynamic MRI. And uh, when in, in the laboratory, we would inject the nucleus with uh, various radio opaque markers. We would watch the migration as the bulge would come through, touch a nerve root, and now you would 
match where the disc bulge is with the precise anatomic pathway. I mean, if it goes to your right toe when you sit for 20 minutes slouched and your right toe goes on fire, you, we know it's the L5 right root. And that's exactly where the disc bulge is. Um, in any case, now we're going to stack what's called stacking the thrust line. So we're nice and tall, and now we squeeze the spine. You can see the whole disc is uh, uh, experiencing movement, but there's no pressure posteriorly and nothing come out the nerve root. Over the years, we did all sorts of experiments that gave us insight uh, into furthering our understanding on this mechanism. We did one experiment with, with just normal people. In fact, the screen was, you don't have any disabling back pain. We put a bare Olympic bar on their back, 45 pounds, and just asked them to pelvic tilt into flexion and extension while they were standing as we were measuring the length changes of their erector spinae. That's what we were investigating. Do 10 repetitions. We had to abandon the experiment because of the pain provocation of normal people, just taking them through the range, and then we were exposing the painful, delaminated collagen in the back of their discs that they didn't even know they had yet. And we went and further investigated that. So that's the uh, primary story of uh, disc bulges. People will say, oh, uh, in the interview, I bent forward and flushed the toilet and it felt as though someone stuck a knife in my back. It's a disc bulge. That pattern and report of the incident there aren't too many other alternate explanations. And then when they lay on their tummy for five minutes, maybe put two fists under their chin, they stand up and it's so much better. So again, they're using posture and stress to mitigate the dynamics of that very dynamic disc bulge. And it's really quite easy to determine in the well, by that, if you know what you're doing. The, the patient's actually getting not just to the mechanism of injury, but also the specific, the specific treatment that they need. Extension feels good, flexion feels bad. Well, now we're getting into the whole issue of empowering the patient. So if they haven't been to a clinician who understands that level of mechanism, uh, and uh, the, the, the patient remains hopeless, no wonder they develop psychosocial issues. Oh, the doctor can't figure it out. I must have something wrong with my life. Um, actually not, it's just you haven't been to a master clinician yet that can show you very precisely why when you drive your car you get back pain and your right toe falls asleep. Uh, that is almost always something to do with a disc bulge. If I can just take one more. Uh, now, I've given you one pathway to a disc bulge. That's probably the most common among people who sit a lot at work. But another one is growing in our population, Bill. Uh, I'm not on social media, but uh, there are forces and pressures, if you follow that world, from a lot of trainers who say, if you want to get strong, you have to deadlift. Well, realize I love the deadlift because I work with a lot of top deadlifters to uh, uh, allow them to take that amount of load without hurting their back, or at least manage a back condition that's existing. So on one hand, I love the deadlift. The problem is it's a highly technical uh, exercise, and we can talk about the mechanics of that if you like. We're going to be certainly teaching that at the Parker Conference. But nonetheless, when a trainer uh, takes a person, say a stay-at-home mom once again, and has her deadlifting her own body weight after three months, that is not on from a biological perspective. And what they end up doing are creating micro fractures in the end plate. So here's another one of Dynamic Disc Design's wonderful models. Every single one of these is modeled off a real patient. This was a very famous uh, power lifter, but when I squeeze the spine and you look down uh, into the vertebral body, you'll see the nucleus that has been dyed blue squirts through an end plate fracture up into the vertebral body. So. What happens there is now that disc becomes lax. It's lost its stiffness or turgid uh, uh, feature so that now it squeezes and it becomes 
allowing micro movements. So if you let a little bit of air out of your car tire, it's sloppy on the road. This is exactly what happens. So this pathway to disc herniation has started with a heavy deadlift. They've damaged the end plate. We've got a little bit of laxity. Now the collagen really starts to delaminate much more quickly. And the pathway to a posterior disc bulge, if they don't use good mechanics, uh, they start getting, which you can see here now, you see the delamination in the collagen that's accelerated by the loss of disc height. Then also, if you get an in-plate fracture, you're going to get macrophages migrating into the nucleus material, releasing these proteolytic enzymes, and now you're going to have an inflammatory disorder as well. Another, yet another <laughs> pathway to pain. And eating its way through the disc and contributing to the possibly to the disc herniation. Well, you know, it, oh, we could go on oh, this yeah. <laughs> for hours, but it's so interesting, again, when I listen to the juniors uh, at the university talk, they'll say, oh, well, the outer third of the disc is, is innervated, and they're reading material from old cadavers. That's where you get or harvest your spines from. The virgin spine in a young person that has not had any cumulative damage when you squeeze it, it, it builds up so much pressure, it kills anything that is growing into it. In other words, a young virgin disc doesn't have any nerves or peripheral sprouting of veins or arteries into it. The pressure kills it all. But when you damage a disc, uh, you lose the pressure. Now you can see the ingrowth of the vascularization, which adds more stiffness but now you grow nerves in, so the more damage occurs, the more nerves invaginate into the, the disc, and you actually grow hardware to, to, to sense pain even better. So you become a better at, at, at producing pain. You get sprouting in, in there and also sensitization. So, so with this, with, that's, that we call that discogenic pain, when they, when they have all those, the new, new um, vascularization that takes place in there, our discs are always under pressure, like a tire is. Is that, yes. is that so? And, and unless it has been so damaged that the pressure now leaks through end plate fractures or delaminated collagen. But a healthy disc, yes, is a healthy always disc under is always pressure. Under, like your tire. So. And in fact, what we uh, showed, we, we put students to bed for a, a couple of days and measured the disc swelling. And if, you're, uh, if you go into a weightless environment like the astronauts and the cosmonauts, they grow a couple of inches after 24 hours in space. Their spine is under stress. Some of them are on uh, painkillers for back pain when, when they're up at the uh, space station. I've treated so, astronauts. Yeah, and, I know. <laughs> and, 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 and I've seen a few with implant dis disorders. I just wonder if that swelling starts causing some type of tearing of the Sharpie's fibers or what? Thank you. Thank you. Because That's exactly what I'll, it does. I'll see modic changes in you know, in these, these astronauts. We also get it when we get, um, and I take care of wounded warriors when I was at Walter Reed, where a bomb goes off under an, an armored vehicle and you get micro fractures up and down the spine, diffuse back pain, take an MR later and you see all this bony edema at every level in the lumbar spine. It's, it's, it's just, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt really bad for about six months. Modic one will turn into modic two. You get a degenerative disc disease, it'll, it'll quiet down. So, so this, this is fascinating. I love this, to, this topic. <laughs> so so if, if discs are always under pressure, what happens when you put somebody in traction? Well, I measured that about 25 years ago with some of the uh, decompression techniques, either on a table or hanging with uh, the anti-gravity boots and, and whatnot. And there's no question, it accelerates the fluid flow back into the disc. So there's a diurnal variation of fluid flow. Throughout the day, you actually shrink, as you know, as you squeeze the fluids out of the disc. And then at night, you suck up the fluids. The disc is hydrophilic and it attracts water and it restores the height. When you first get out of bed in the morning, you're actually under more stress to put your socks on than you are later in the day. In fact, Stover Snook at Liberty Mutual uh, Insurance Company did uh, an experiment where he just said to patients, don't flex forward in the morning. It's okay later on in the day. And you know he had uh, a very impressive decrease in general discogenic back pain. Um, but nonetheless, uh, 
No, I just forgot. Oh, your... I, 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 it hooked me off. So your disc, if you've got a disc lesion, it's more hydrated in the morning. Yes. And the morning is when you bend over the sink to brush your teeth. It's when you bend over. So you take this, this enlarged disc and then you bend over the sink in the morning for all your toiletry um, um, hygiene and at the worst possible time. And then you bend down and put your shoes on. And my, the, the clinical question I would ask people, does it hurt worse to put your shoes on? Or to take your your shoes off. Nice. And yeah. just that that question right there means it's probably discal, because like you said, the diurnal effect in the morning you're, you had that nice hydrated disc, and if it's a disc lesion, it's going to be bigger too. Maybe. Uh, no. Maybe. Oh, no, let's hear, maybe. Let's hear. Maybe. I would say it depends on that one because when you change the height of the disc you also change the uh, stress on uh, nerves and tension you change the foraminal openings you change the stress on ligamentum flavum uh, it does a lot of things so i would then have to say okay that is the report from the patient i need to investigate that further mm -hmm. to really hone it down and confirm what it is and eliminate what it isn't so we were talking about lumbar disc herniations and, and also about certain athletes who have stiffness and other athletes who go after flexibility. And there's, there's a, a real trend today to mix the two in a particular type of exercise program that's become very popular. At Parker University, we just, about a year and a half, two years ago, we started a Parker Fit Gym. And we're trying to do it right. Functional fitness done right is our model. We have some Olympic lifting, we have, um, you know, heavy barbells, kettlebells, pull-ups, rings, and there's a, and there's these these uh, hip pelvis machines that are you know basically you can put your your spine into great flexion or extension while you're doing those, and I'm trying to encourage a mechanism where we do this in such a way we don't create injury. Um, I would ask a couple questions. One is what recommendations would you give me as we're moving forward with Parker Fit? functional fitness done right. And also, what's your opinion on Olympic lifting? Is Olympic lifts, is that something everybody should be doing? Okay, uh, let me go with the Parker Fit okay. first and remind me about the Olympic lifts. You know the first two words that are going to come out of my mouth and it is, it depends. <laughs> so to create resilience in the human body, you cannot have it all. Biological adaptation will not allow that. And think of any system you like. If you want to adapt a more endurable athlete, you will do it at the expense of the fast twitch ma uh, metabolism. In other words, you have to take away some explosive power if you want to be more endurable. If you want to be more explosive, you aren't going to be as endurable. They're two competing mechanisms. You call that, you can have anything, but you can't have everything. Thank you. So it is a game of trade-offs. In order to optimize the game of trade-offs, you have to know your goal. So I say to every performance-based athlete here, what is your goal? Now, the athlete should immediately be able to say, I need this, this, and this to win the world championship. Or if the athlete says, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, what's the goal of your training program? And if they say, I, I, I don't know, I say, you better get a new coach. You are not, this is a very, this is a precision game. So how we get to that level is, uh, I say, write down what you need for your sport. Now, if we're just dealing with a Parker student, they are playing the sport of life. They are playing the sport to be a successful clinician and they want to be able to be a, a high performance clinician for 40 years and retire with the best of health and play with their grandkids. Now, is that your goal? You better be sure of it. Mm -hmm. If that is your goal, you are now going to train to avoid extremes. If you get really strong and heavy loads, you're going to have to really uh, uh, trade off the loss of mobility. But if you want to be a yoga monster or, which is fine, but you're really going to have to back off strength now. So some people just want to be in the middle. Now you have to avoid straight, e extremes. So forget about these myths of being uh, the strongest power lifter in the gym because you will pay the price if you mix that up with, with mobility. Anyway, so my first question is, what's your goal? Now, formalize what you need to meet that goal. And if they want to be a deadlifter, okay. They need so much mobility in the hips, but not too much. They need stiff hamstrings. They need big grip strength. They need a stiffened core. Now, do you see how precise that was? So now I say, all right, that's what you need. 
Now I'm going to measure those in you. Oh, you've got sufficient hand grip strength. Why are you doing an over under grip? You should be double over, bending the bar, fixing your back, uh, creating symmetric stress. I mean, you're, you're not only practicing the sport that doesn't fit your body and, and pain trigger anymore. Um, anyway, you get what I mean. So I know what do they need, what do they currently have, and if they have it, I don't train it, but I train the things they don't have. And then I say, what's the best tool we have in our training box that will train that thing there that is what you need and it's in the highest demand. So now that's how I would design the program. Uh, but for the average student, they won't be that precise in knowing exactly what they need. So then I say, do you have pain or not? If you have pain, I want to know why, where, wherever it is in the body, and we are going to create hacks around the pain, and we're going to figure out what you need to get rid of that pain. So they might say, oh, I've got neck pain. I'll get a lot of combative athletes, wrestlers, and whatnot with neck pain. I say, well, what do you do for your neck pain? Oh, well, I do flexion exercise, and then I do extension exercise. I said, good, but I just measured that shear load in your neck is causing your neck pain. You are training to cause yourself to remain as a neck patient. Let me show you something. Make a neutral neck, push your tongue hard to the roof of the mouth, grimace, build some initial activation of the flexors, put your fists under the chin, and push up with about three kilos. Hold it for 20 seconds. Do that three times. Come back in a week. Oh, Doc, amazing. My neck pain is gone. Yeah, we just took away the stress pattern that we just documented was causing your neck pain, and that's exact. you just picked the scab every day and you wanted to get better. It had nothing to do with neck exercise. It had everything to do with understanding the precision of why you had pain. A good example, people come in every day to my practice. I, Doc, I hurt my back and I've got a tight hamstring, so I'm stretching the tight hamstring out. And they're coming in, it turns out it's a, it's a nerve root. You, you, everybody, every clinician sees this. They're sitting there stretching, doing flexion of their spine, trying to stretch out what they perceive as a hamstring stretch, which is really an S1. It's not a tight muscle, it's, it's not a, a tight, tight muscle, nerve. It's a tight nerve. And, they're, and what they're doing is, is re, they're flexing that spine and the disc, the disc they're, they're creating the problem. And it feels good for 30, and I say it feels good for about 30 minutes. Yeah, about 30 minutes, it feels good, and then it feels worse because you stimulate the mechanoreceptors down there. And it's, it's a over straight stretch reflex. Yep. Yep. So, <laughs> so that's, that's one of those things. When, I, when I've lectured, if you, if you do nothing else, have them stop stretching their hamstrings when they come in. If nothing else, for a disc lesion. If they perceive tight hamstrings, yes. stop stretching yep. them, and guess what? The mobility will return. So how often do tight hamstrings affect low back pain? Is that a major generator? Well... It depends. I, 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 it certainly <laughs> does. So uh, if we go back to the Norwegian military studies where they measured hamstring tightness at the uh, at boot camp when they first joined the military, and then they were followed for two years, there was no predictive ab ability based on the straight leg raise whether they were going to get back pain in their military career or not there was a mild predictive association with asymmetry between the right hamstring and the left hamstring. That has also been confirmed in road cyclists and in marathon runners. Those with asymmetric hams uh, develop pain. Now, there are, for a runner, for example, I probably want a little bit of stiffness because the great ones who I measure uh, are, are more elastic athletes. The ones who stretch away, they do the runner stretches and whatnot, they stretch away the elasticity and they have to use more muscle with each running stride versus the bunny rabbit, as I call them, who just, they pulse muscles. They pulse, pulse, pulse as they run along. And so for those, so do you see it depends once mm -hmm. again, I need to know something about their particular style of running and I might try and stiffen their hamstrings. I might stiffen their feet with a foot ricochet exercise to get more of that storage and recovery of elastic energy. That's exactly what I was going to say. So yeah. basically, it's, it's, you're having injury recovery from the springiness of it, not from the contract, the, the, the um, having a nice long, uh, what do you call it, gait? For, well, stride length, yeah, maybe. Stride length. 
But uh, again, I need to know the strategy of uh, the sport and where their failure is. If they say, oh no, we hit the wall at uh, mile 21, mm -hmm. and uh, then I say, okay, well, you can train endurance or you can become more elastic. Now, they said, what do you mean more elastic? We've never heard of this before. I said, well, that's because you've only ever trained in the States where the elastic uh, thought on long distance running isn't as precocious as in other countries who, if you haven't noticed, have been producing some pretty good elastic long distance runners who are muscle pulsers. But uh, anyway, oh, these are wonderful discussions to have. Well, thank you so much for having me today, Dr. McGill. Oh, <laughs> thanks so much, Bill. <laughs>